Good morning, Pastor Richard Rentner, your supply pastor or uh, guest pastor at uh, Christ Lutheran in Athens. Good to be with you again on this Palm Sunday morning. And uh, as we have done last week, we uh, shared a little quick study of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. If you've uh, been able to purchase this book and have had some time to read it, I invite you to join me now for just a couple of minutes uh, reviewing that first chapter, and then we'll enter our worship on this Sunday of the Passion, or Palm. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, wrote this book, as I mentioned uh, last week, while he was um, under uh, confinement, verbally anyway, uh, he was prohibited by the Gestapo from writing or publishing things or speaking in public. And uh, because he was cut off from his community, as we are cut off now from our community, it became very important for him to uh, address that issue of the importance of community. Uh, just a little recap from last week, we began that first chapter and the, the key theme or idea was uh, to quote him, Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. It's a, a privilege to have a community of faith to live in, and uh, we ought not to take that for, for granted. Uh, this is the idea from the first part of that chapter, because the church is Christ's church and not our own. It's important to remember not to allow our own hopes and wishes for the church to define what the church Probably you've had an experience at one time or another when the church disappointed you. Maybe members of the church weren't what you hoped they would be. We want the church to be more caring or, or more open, more welcoming, more attentive to our needs or the needs of some other group in the community. Those are all good things. But Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church, and he will form it. He will shape it. He will define it as he wishes. So don't ever feel like you have to leave one church community for another because your own church isn't quite what you had hoped it would be. Be patient. Christ isn't finished with it yet, even as he's not finished with you. Now, to finish that first chapter from pages 31 to 39 today, I begin with this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Because Christian community is founded solely on Jesus Christ, it is a spiritual and not a psychic reality. I'll define that word psychic in just a moment. But spiritual ought to be pretty clear for us. Spiritual means created by the Holy Spirit. And psychic the way Dietrich Bonhoeffer uses that word and poorly translated in English really means human. Contrast between a spiritual reality and a human. A spiritual reality, says Bonhoeffer, is based solely on the word of God. A human reality is based instead on our human wishes and desires. I don't know if you've ever experienced a church where uh, there's been a small group or a clique within that church and, and uh, on the surface, you'd say, what's wrong with that? People gravitate to others they like in the church. But sometimes the temptation to be that small group within the church is to let our human interaction with each other become more important than the entire church community. And then when difficulties arise, when hard times pop up, as they will, our allegiance in that small group is to each other and not to the larger. I experienced that in one church I served where the worship team, the music team was so close to each other, a good thing, but the problem was they did not participate in any kind of Bible study, any kind of uh, larger church community. Church for them was the worship team, the music team. And when the time came, when the head of that team uh, had to step down, had to remove herself, from her leadership role. The entire worship team left the church because for them, you see, that small group was the church. That said, Bonhoeffer ends this first chapter with this quotation I thought was kind of a good one to hold on to, page 37. Human love breeds hothouse flowers. 
Spiritual love creates the fruits that grow healthily in accord with God's goodwill, the rain and storm and sunshine of God's love. And then this quotation from the very end of the chapter, page 39, Jesus Christ alone is our unity. Through him alone, we have access to one another, joy in one another, and fellowship with one another. Next Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, I invite you to join us again as we look at uh, chapter two. I'm not how far, uh, sure how far we'll get through chapter two, but please join us. We'll spend a little time uh, reviewing that. And remember, of course, that uh, we do have Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday worship. You can access that on Zoom here through the church, even as you access these Sunday morning. One last reminder. Um, if you would like a little devotional guide for uh, the month of April and uh, continuing on beyond that, go to the ELCA website, scroll down from on the homepage to resources. And there you'll find a section called prayer resources. And under that, you'll find prayer ventures for April, 2020. Wonderful little daily calendar of topics to pray for each day this month again, on the ELCA website. And now let's begin our worship, and we begin with this invocation. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is present, who gives life, who calls into existence all things that do not exist. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you, it is forgiveness, and so we now confess. Join me. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new heart and right spirit that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive now the good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace to you. Amen. Now we begin our worship with our uh, prayer of the day for this Palm Sunday. Uh, we pray. Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives praise him as Savior who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The readings for Palm Sunday, if you'd like to follow these throughout the week, uh, is our processional gospel, which is our gospel for today, Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11, but also Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9, Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16, Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11, and then, as I said, our gospel, Matthew 21. So we gather on this day, and we focus our thoughts, our attention this day on the gospel. This is the familiar triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's from the 21st chapter of St. Matthew, beginning of the first verse. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage, Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, 
humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Most Palm Sundays, you are given a palm in church and uh, perhaps do a Palm Sunday procession. Um, I, I was told by Katie Beth that you will have palms available in a container outside the door of the church. Feel free to stop by and pick up a palm and bring it home with you. If you have, uh, if you know how to fold it into a cross, that's a wonderful thing you might do. And put it where you can see it, at least throughout this. Thank you. Now let's give some thought to that uh, Palm Sunday. God's grace and comfort and peace and strength be with you now and always, especially in these days. In our Lutheran tradition, the sixth Sunday in Lent is known by two names, Palm Sunday and the Sunday of the Passion. Because we don't have a lot of time together on Zoom, I'd like to focus on the first of those, on Palm Sunday, and invite you to come back and worship with us on Good Friday when we'll hear the Passion account here. Let me begin my message today with this warning. The events described in this first part of Matthew 21 are unabashedly political. Not partisan, mind you, not liberal or conservative, not Republican or Democrat, but political nonetheless. If you're among those who say the church should keep its nose out of politics at all costs, I'm afraid that Jesus is going to disappoint you today. And I think I will too. For Jesus himself, you see, is a very political person. His words and his actions have political implication. And his politics, in large part, ended up costing him his life. If you and I are to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, if we were to walk in his footsteps, then by definition, we are included among those who are political also. The scary thing is, if Jesus died on account of his political divisive claims, then dare we expect something different for ourselves? As Bonhoeffer famously said, when Christ calls a person to follow, he bids him come and die. Now I'll explain all of this uh, Palm Sunday stuff here by using an example that first surfaced by uh, two writers, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan, in their now famous book, The Last Week, What Gospels Really Teach About Jesus' Final Days in Jerusalem. Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan paint two pictures of two processions into the holy city on that day, that spring day just before Passover. One of them is the procession I just shared with you from Matthew's Gospel. Jesus riding into the city on, on, a, on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, very humbly. There's no majestic white horse for Jesus. There's no battle armor. There's nothing. It's entirely fitting for one acclaimed by the mostly peasant crowd as the son of David who would come in the name of the now, as parades go, this one must have been pretty simple, really. It wasn't highly orchestrated. It involved people from Jerusalem, both residents and visitors, those in town for Passover, coming out to greet Jesus, meet him. How many people were this? In this day and age, people were concerned about the size of their parades. Well, there were maybe at this time 40,000 people living in Jerusalem. And if the population had swelled to twice that size, 80,000 with out-of-pound visitors there for Passover, maybe it was 80,000, maybe 100,000 people in town that day. Many of them came out to 
to greet Jesus. And they came to shout their hosannas, an Aramaic word that means, Lord, help us, Lord, save us. They did this because they looked to Jesus as their Lord, as, as their Savior, one sent by God to release them from the oppression. But Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan hypothesize a second day, the uh, basis on non-biblical sources. Jesus and his entourage approached the city from the east, from the Mount of Olives, even as the scriptures had foretold. Well, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, enters the city from the west, from his palace overlooking the Mediterranean Sea at Caesarea Maritima. Pilate is traveling to Jerusalem on a war horse at the head of a column of Roman soldiers. You can picture battle flags and banners flying high, soldiers wearing their armor, carrying their weapons. Drums beat out a cadence for their march, and trumpets announce his arrival at the gates. Now, all of this is intentional. It's meant to show the strength of Rome. And if there were rebels in town in Jerusalem at that time, which there likely were, uh, Pilate's hope was that they would see this show of force themselves and keep the peace. I was going to say by God's name, but I thought, no, by Caesar's name, they vowed to keep the peace. So here's one parade flouting strength and might and authority, and the other parade revealing humility. One parade demonstrating raw power, power to crush, power to destroy if need be. And the parade, well, what exactly did it portray? Compassion for the weak, powerless, justice, mercy, kindness, love? Have we ever seen such a thing in our time? I think we have. I think we can recall seeing some like this, uh, somewhat like this, a time when we saw a parade of poor people, poor black people, peaceful people marching toward Montgomery, Alabama in March of 1960. As they approached the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, they were met by police on horses with billy clubs and weapons, tear gas and fire hoses. Was Jesus there that day in Selma, Alabama? I believe he was. When raw power encounters peaceful protesters, you know what's a good likelihood that somebody's gonna get hurt? And somebody might even, that certainly. You see, ours is a strong nation that depends on power and might for our security. We have a military that outshines all other militaries in the world. The U.S. spends more on maintaining our military strength than these seven nations together, China, Saudi Arabia, India, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Germany. As of last year, 2019, about 15% of all of our federal spending went to support our military plus roughly half of our discretionary spending. Our Navy has 11 carrier groups, soon to be 12. No other nation in the world has been that. Our Air Force is unsurpassed in weaponry, and we continue to fund our military at breakneck speed. But we've discovered, much toward its may, that while we have this military strength and might and power, we are unable to provide adequate protective gear for our nurses and doctors and EMTs. We don't have enough hospital beds or ventilators for the thousands who, are, have, who now have or will have COVID-19. One in seven Americans doesn't get an adequate diet, including over 16 million children. The U.S. now ranks 27th in the world for health care and education, down from 6th in the world 30 years ago. 
If there were to be a parade today, like those parades entering Jerusalem in the year 30 or thereabout, where do you think you'd spot Jesus? With the military or with the poor, the sick, the marginalized? Jesus, who fed the masses with the little boy's lunch of bread and fish. Jesus, who healed the sick and cured the blind and cast out demons. Jesus, who crossed cultural boundaries to talk with women and lepers and children. Jesus, who himself was unjustly treated and killed, yet who cried out again and again for justice, the poor and the widows and the orphans. That definition of true religion from James chapter 1, verse 27, rings in my ears this morning. Religion that our God accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You see, in the end, it always comes down to two competing grades. Dolores Duffner is a uh, Benedictine uh, sister, and she has written this song. It's actually in our hymnal, in the Evangelical Lutheran Worship book. Uh, I believe it's hymn number 431. Um, usually it's sung on Christ the King Sunday, Reign of Christ Sunday at the end of the year. But it's increasingly appropriate for this Palm Sunday. Uh, the first line reads like this. O oh Christ, what can it mean for us to claim you as our king? What royal face have you revealed whose praise the church would sing? Aspiring not to glory's height, to power, wealth, and fame, you walked a different, lowly way another's will do. We begin our Holy Week entrance by marking how the empire of God, whose nearness Jesus came to announce, looks to welcome quite a different kind of king indeed. Amen. And now turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, let us pray for the church for the world, and for all who are in any need. And if you care to join in saying your mercy is great after each petition, God of mercy, awaken your church to new proclamations of your faithfulness. By your spirit, give us bold and joyful words to speak, that we sustain the weary with the message of your redemption. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of mercy, quiet the earth where it trembles and shakes. Protect the vulnerable. Prosper the work of scientists and engineers and researchers who find ways to restore creation to health and wholeness. Pray especially for those doctors and scientists seeking a cure for this pandemic that plagues the world. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. O oh God of mercy, drive away fear and anger that causes us to turn against one another. Give courage to leaders who seek liberation for the oppressed. Bring peace and hope to those who are in prison and those who are confined in their homes, and especially to those prisoners who face execution. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. O God of mercy, send your saving help to all who suffer abuse, insult, discrimination, or contempt. Heal the wounded and the sick. Comfort the dying and their families. Bring peace to those suffering chronic or terminal illnesses, especially this coronavirus. Tend to all who cry out for relief. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. And now, God of mercy, when we breathe our last, you raise us to eternal life. We count on that. We believe in that. With all your witnesses in heaven and on earth, let us boldly confess the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
and our hope. Hear us, O God, your mercy is good. And now, according to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers. We commend them to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now join me as we pray that prayer which our Lord has taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we end our worship with this blessing and benediction. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation, holy God. Speaking, spoken, and inspiring, may this same God bless you, unbind you, comfort you, heal you, and send you in love and peace. Now, one final word before I uh, end this. I know that you have been remembering your church and your giving, even though we can't gather together. It's important that the church be able to pay salaries and pay utilities, just like we do things at home. So please, if you haven't sent an offering to Christ Lutheran in Athens, um, feel free to do so anytime. Now God bless you on your way. May, give you, may God give you strength and comfort in the days ahead.